Hi, I'm Dr. Wolf, a forensic pathologist, and um, of course I've received a lot of questions about Bob Saget. Anytime a celebrity passes away, public figure passes away, I always get questions about what my thoughts are. Well, at this point, I would say uh, anything I say would be speculation, but there are some decent clues from the autopsy itself. Um, the fact that they ruled out foul play is helpful. So anytime we do autopsies, we, the first thing we want to do is rule out foul play. That, you can't miss that. That's a never event. You, you can't miss a foul play. So what does that mean? Well, that means there's no trauma to the body. So no head trauma, no gunshot wounds, no uh, knife wounds, no injuries to the neck indicating strangulation. It also means um, there's no evidence that the person who was assailed uh, if they were assailed, uh, fought back. So things like defensive wounds. So you can see injuries on the hands or forearms, things like that. The other thing is for foul play uh, is you're going to look to see if uh, the room was broken into. Uh, and again, we're not really talking about Bob Saget here because he, he died in a hotel room and everything was secure, which is why they were able to uh, rule, that, rule it out. But you look to see if a residence was broken into. Was the door broken in? Was the window smashed in? Was anything missing? Were they robbed? Um, so once you do all that, you can say no foul play. Now, with regards to, I think the other statement was no drug use was evident. And so what that means is uh, they didn't find any paraphernalia for drug use. So the common things that you would think about, pill bottles, uh, syringes, tourniquets, um, spoons that have been burned, pipes, um, any powdery substance, white or gray powdery substance. So no drugs. Uh, and no foul play. And so at that point, then, you are in the realm of a nat probable natural death. Um, but that's why they pinned the autopsy report. So it's very common, actually, uh, for this scenario to find somebody who is deceased. And, you know, you, you do the autopsy, you can see they weren't murdered, and then you basically wait for toxicology. Because, and the other thing is histology. Histology is where you take uh, tissue samples, you look at them under the microscope, and you see if there's any microscopic disease. So in this case, that's what they're going to be waiting for. They're going to be waiting on toxicology. Well, uh, I know you're probably thinking, well, if there's no signs of drugs uh, at the scene, then why would you do to toxicology? Well, you always have to do toxicology because you don't know what somebody might be taking illicitly and covering it up, uh, or you don't know what they're taking uh, from a prescription perspective. And it might be an interaction, uh, a drug interaction or a toxicity. For instance, um, I don't see it as much now, but I feel like earlier in my career, I used to see a lot of accidental opioid overdoses. And I'm not talking about uh, injectable. I'm not talking about, um, you know, heroin, fentanyl, something like that. I'm talking about people that had really bad back pain and then took too many oxycodone. Uh, that sort of thing. So you want to look for that in toxicology as well. Um, and then you have to consider uh, medications that the person was on. We don't know his full medical history. And so uh, was he on any medications uh, that could have uh, been toxic? Uh, some medications, for instance, cause what's called long QT syndrome, which if you've seen an EKG, you can, uh, the spike all the way out to the bump that comes after the spike, you know, I'm explaining this in layman's terms, if that's increased, if that uh, interval is increased, people have an increased risk of sudden death. So things like that. I mean, there, there's so many different permutations of, of what you can look for in a case like this in toxicology. Uh, secondly is, uh, with toxicology, it's not just blood toxicology, but vitreous toxicology. That's the fluid from inside the eye. You're going to be looking for electrolyte abnormalities. You're going to be looking for um, blood sugar abnormalities. Um, we don't know, uh, or it doesn't seem that he's a diabetic, but perhaps he's a diabetic. We don't know. Um, but you would always want to do that in a case uh, to see if the blood sugar is elevated and ketones are present, because you're going to be thinking diabetic ketoacidosis. So, um, you know, those are the main issues. And then histology, that's microscopic examination. So basically, you take samples of each tissue, brain, uh, lung, heart, kidneys, adrenals, pancreas, you name it. We take sections of it. Look at it under the microscope and see, is there any evidence of disease? Is there pneumonia maybe that wasn't picked up? Is there, um, uh, you know, something like um, uh, inflammation in the heart, um, uh, inflammation, you know, like acute pancreatitis and things like that? Uh, 
So um, histology is not often uh, diagnostic in cases like this. Usually what happens in a case like this is the medical examiner does the case and he or she finds um, a natural disease process, perhaps even multiple natural disease processes. And so what I mean by that is uh, something like a coronary artery disease, so atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease, and in layman's terms, a uh, blockage of the heart, uh, coronary arteries in the heart. Uh, something like hypertension, so increased thickness of the heart wall muscle. Um, lung diseases, uh, you know, not just pneumonia, but other lung diseases that could explain um, sudden death, things like pulmonary hypertension, uh, even COPD, emphysema. Uh, it could be something, um, you know, you want to look at, at the brain and you want to see if there's anything uh, microscopically that could be helpful uh, looking at the brain tissue, uh, things like tumors, things like, um, you know, inflammation, encephalitis and things like that. Now, with all that being said, I don't think there's a consideration that uh, this is going to be a microscopic diagnosis. In a 65-year-old man, the most likely explanation would be a heart-related disease. So um, just playing the percentages, coronary artery disease, so atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease, and that's where the coronary arteries in the heart become occluded, and when they become occluded uh, with, you know, plaque, cholesterol, that sort of thing, then what you have is a situation where you have decreased delivery of blood and oxygen to the heart muscle itself, and that makes the heart muscle um, irritable. And when it becomes irritable, it can go into an arrhythmia and people can die. And it's the most common cause of death I see at autopsy day after day after day. Most of my cases are atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease. And then, uh, or something like hypertension, where you have an increased thickness of the heart wall and uh, it's the same process. You don't have enough oxygen getting to the heart muscle, it becomes irritable, and then it goes into an, a spontaneous arrhythmia. So uh, just playing the percentages, uh, probably cardiac related death, cardiopulmonary related death, but we just can't know until we have the full testing back, uh, the toxicology, the uh, histology, things like that. And people, I, I know you're thinking, well, why did they say it's gonna take 10 to 12 weeks to get the results? that's because toxicology takes that long to get back very often. And so does in, in, any investigation that needs to be done. And I'm talking about medical records and things like that. So um, I don't think there's anything criminal here, but we, they have to go through and, and look and see if there's any explanation. So, uh, but yeah, toxicology takes that long depending on kind of where it goes in the country and what state it is. So some people send to their state lab and there's a huge backlog of tests and it takes months to come back. And others send to a private lab and those can become those can come back more quickly. Um, the lab that I send to gets the results back in seven to 14 days sometimes. So I don't necessarily have that problem, but I'm also not working in a medical examiner state, which is a state uh, operated um, death investigation system. And they tend to use um, labs that, you know, they take a little longer, not because they're not good, but because there is such a huge backlog of cases and there's a huge volume of cases that come in. So once the histology comes back, where medical records are reviewed and the toxicology comes back, then you put it all together. And that's one thing you have to take away from all of this is that forensics is something that is not done in a vacuum. You have to do everything you find is in context. So you have to put every finding in context and say, what is the most likely explanation? Uh, we'll probably revisit this when they release uh, the autopsy findings, the final report. Um, for now, the most likely cause is going to be a cardiopulmonary death, probably atherosclerotic or hypertensive cardiovascular disease. So uh, that's kind of a brief summary of the Bob Saget situation, and we'll see how it turns out.